Welcome back to the Happy Farm Life Podcast. My name is Sierra Richard, and today we have a very special episode. I try to do something a little bit special for Women Pharmacists Day every single year, and this year is no different. But I'm doing something that I've not done before, which is to bring a guest on the Happy Farm Life Podcast. So today I am here with Dr. Carlene Lynx. She's a clinical pharmacist, an integrative life coach, and one of my good friends. So I'm really excited to introduce her today. And for us to talk a little bit about the role of women in pharmacy today and how that it's a little bit different from the past. So welcome, Carlene. Thank you very much for having me. Very excited. Thank you, Sarah. All right. So before we go too deep into the episode, I want to set the stage a little bit about the history of women in pharmacy. So if you go back to way back when pharmacy was apothecaries, right? That's the history of pharmacy. You will find women. Women were involved in apothecaries way back in the ancient times when apothecaries were very common. You didn't have modern medicine, but then modern medicine evolved. And unfortunately, women were kind of left out for a while. So the first female pharmacist in the United States appeared around the 1700s and she was in Boston and she had her own apothecary shop. But when we fast forward to modern medicine today, it wasn't until the mid to late 1800s that pharmacists were women and were receiving degrees in the United States to actually practice as pharmacists. And you would think that as that started to roll out, that pharmacists were really integrating women into the profession, but that wasn't really the case in all areas, especially when it comes to leadership. And I actually got to see a little bit of this history whenever I was a student. I was a regional officer in the American Pharmacist Association, and I got the awesome opportunity to travel to the APHA headquarters. And I got to see for the first time in history, three women who were on the wall as the immediate past president, the current president, and the president-elect. And that had never happened before. And this was only a few years ago. I'm not that far Mm -hmm. out of pharmacy school. And so that kind of brings us to today, where we're at and where we would like to go. And so that's why I brought Carlene on here to kind of talk through some of those things together. So Carlene, why don't you introduce yourself before we dive into some questions I have? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, first of all, for having me as a guest and obviously our friendship. It means a lot to me, but um, I am Carlene Link and I am a clinical pharmacist by training, everyone. I graduated back in 2008 from the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy and stayed down in Columbus, Ohio and did my PGY1 residency. And then um, for the immediate five and a half years after residency, um, I obtained board certification in pharmacotherapy and practiced as an internal medicine clinical specialist. Then I left and went into indirect patient care for almost another five years for an international drug information company, um, totally different side of pharmacy. It was pretty neat. And then during that time, I became a mom to my two kids, which was great. And then um, when my youngest son turned one or just about to turn one, that's when I left um, corporate America and I went back into clinical practice as a um, part-time clinical um, staff pharmacist, which I've been doing now for Oh gosh, it's been about five years. So the, the next five years of my career, um, it's been a bit of a non-traditional path for me, but I've also just discovered that I've had some other passions that I fostered, including medical writing and um, guest blogging, and really have, have developed such a great network of pharmacists through social media and some other opportunities. And um, also uh, during the pandemic decided that I wanted to help other moms in medicine during transitions and tough transitions in their lives and became an integrative life coach where we go not just with in the mindset, but we really start creating that future version of who you want to be right now. And it's been very fulfilling. Awesome. Thank you for explaining a little bit about what you do and where you came from. So I want to dive into that a little bit deeper and specifically your experience as a woman in pharmacy and balancing your career and motherhood. So can you just give us a little bit of an insight on what that's been like and maybe some of the really benefits to being a woman in pharmacy that you've seen, especially on that motherhood side, but also maybe some of the challenges you've experienced? Sure. You know, when I was looking at careers, I actually was more medical school bound, like when I I was kind of in college. And my dad was the one that introduced me to what a clinical pharmacist did and was talking about the flexibility of 
being in pharmacy and still raising a family because I knew I always wanted to be a mom. Like that wasn't something that, you know, some people just know, some people aren't sure. And I want to just, first of all, be here and say you're supported regardless of what you choose. And I thought that was, you know, something that was really impactful for me that I could still be rounding with a team, but still have these kids at home and maybe have some sort of a better work life fit, what I call it. So, um, it, you know, it wasn't bad. It was once when I got to my second son, my the, the, the kind of climate of the company that I had been working for in corporate America was very different. There had been a lot of changes and um, it didn't, the, the support just wasn't there for me anymore, especially as a brand new mom of two little kids. There was high expectation of um, the amount of hours that were worked and it definitely was suggestive that my career needed to be top priority. So a couple of things with that, I had to really sit with a few things. It was number one, my ego that I was struggling, like I could do both. Well, you can do both, right? We, we can do, we really can do anything. But I had to really stop and think, what do I want my work life? What does my work life fit need to look like for me? And it just didn't feel good. I, I gave it a shot. I gave it nine months after coming back from maternity leave. And it, it wasn't, I wasn't the mom that I wanted to be. And I felt like the workplace had gotten to the point where the work wasn't even, um, it wasn't even enjoyable anymore because it just was so, there was a lot of stress. So in that case, I said, well, I could either continue on and stay, you know, as is in a spot where I know what to expect every day, even though it's not ideal, or I can start making a change and look for something that would support me more. And I guess I'm living proof that, um, it, number one, if something doesn't exist, you kind of have to create it and you sort of forge this non-traditional path like I keep talking about. But number two, um, by doing that and going part-time PRN, it allowed me to be a mom and raise my kids and be present and not miss things and not have, you know, choosing to feel this guilt all the time. But then I realized how much I missed clinical practice, like direct patient care. And that's something that I really love. That's the pharmacy that I like to practice, um, in addition to like the consulting and writing. I think it's super fun. Again, that's just me. But um, I do think that there are a lot. It's not just retail and hospital availability. I think a lot of people, when you look at pharmacy, and even if you're in one of those two spots, which you know the majority of pharmacists probably fall somewhere in that continuum, you guys, there's so many opportunities out there, and you just have to be willing to explore and maybe um, understand that your path might be a little bit more non-traditional, which is kind of exciting. And I, I've really, there are pharmacists. They're just in so many different aspects of medicine. I mean, even seeing some of these telehealth companies pop up and developed by pharmacists I think it's amazing so just know that um, you know you can have both however you want that to look and if it's not how it's fitting your current life um, there are options so you have to come up with some sort of a plan to start rolling that out to get to where you want to be but it is possible I think that last thing you said was a really great point is like planning for that life that you want. And you mm -hmm. and I have talked about this a lot with myself because mm -hmm. I don't have kids yet, but that is something that I would like in my future. And so when I knew I didn't want to do night shift anymore and I was going to transition to a new job, we talked a lot about what I wanted my life to look like when I moved into that next phase, if motherhood ended up being something I was able to do in my life what would that look like with my career? And that is how I transitioned into a very non-traditional role in research mm -hmm. pharmacy and being an investigational drug service pharmacist because it gave me a lot more flexibility than I would have if I was staffing in a hospital and being required to do nights and weekends and you know all of the difficult shifts, the switch shifts and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's a really good point that you know there are opportunities out there. They're just not maybe as front facing for some of these better work-life balance or work-life harmony, however you want to describe it, jobs. I just think we have to be willing to maybe put a little bit of that work in ourselves and be more proactive. Um, and I, I'm just saying this from a, a, med like a medical professional standpoint, um, because our, our opportunities might be a little bit more different than you know a lot of the other clinic-based like practitioners out there. But there are, there are a lot of really interesting you know, uh, opportunities that are popping up. So just keep your eyes open and, and network. Make sure you're talking to people that are in your network. It's huge. Yeah, you aren't going to see these jobs just pop up and be handed to you most of the time. You're going to have to do your research or look into it yourselves or explore those opportunities. 
even for me to get experience in investigational drug service pharmacy, I had to kind of advocate for that because when I was in residency, the reason I did the IDS service was because of COVID. I was supposed to be in the cystic fibrosis clinic Mm -hmm. right after COVID hit. Like it was supposed to be in April of 2020. Well, that was such an uncertain time. They hadn't really figured out the plan on how they were going to handle clinics. Some stuff was virtual. We didn't know how to do all of that stuff like great yet. And so they were like, we don't really want you to do this rotation now. And I completely understand and agree. And when I looked at all the rotation opportunities that were available for PGY1s, investigational drug service was not on the list, but it was what I was most interested in because I had been exposed to that on my hematology oncology rotation. So I advocated for myself and went out of the way to ask to see if the preceptor would be willing to take a PGY1, then worked with my RPD to make that happen, to see if the schedule would work. And that's how I got my first experience in investigational drug service. It was because I, it wasn't handed to me. It wasn't even on the list, but I asked for it and advocated for what I needed in order to see if that was an option for me. And then that job opened up where I was at. So I was able to transition into that role. So I think that's Mm -hmm. a really good point. And that kind of brings me into this next question I wanted to talk to you is we know that pharmacy is a very challenging and difficult environment. So what advice do you have for women in pharmacy who are maybe newer in the profession and experiencing some of those challenges and pressures that come with pharmacy, but also want to prevent the burnout that may be associated with that? I would say, and this is speaking from personal experience, is to first of all, make sure that you're prioritizing your um, your health, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health. And I think speaking from residency, and I know you had a demanding residency too, it's really easy to forego that because of the pile of work. <laughs> It's just it just sort of builds up and it's a wonderful experience. It's not that. But um, there has to be if if you're not in a good mindset, then it's going to be really challenging for you to show up professionally, personally, you know, to support your family and friends. Like It's just it's really hard. So you you really do need to support yourself. I will say, too, that. and especially kind of because I'm more on like the mentor end since I've been out for <laughs> so long now, um, find yourself a mentor, you you know, and maybe it's a couple of different people. And it might be maybe it's somebody who just graduated a couple of years ago and has been like more of like a recent, like a newer recent practitioner that maybe knows the ropes of the place that where you're practicing. Or maybe it's somebody like me who's been practicing and has had some life experience tossed into the mix and somebody that's willing to listen and somebody that might just be able to offer you support and advice when solicited or when needed. Um, And I I do think that developing more of like a a fostering more of like a caring and compassionate environment versus like the toxic environments that many of us can experience, even if you don't do residency. I mean, we all know what it's like to have uh, be tossed into a like a challenging work environment. Maybe it's one person, maybe it's a situation. So just sort of knowing that there, there are, you know, ways we have to keep ourselves healthy, first of all, but second of all, you're not expected to know everything. Like we have to drop that pressure of, I need to be everything. Oh my God, if I don't get this right on this, we put, pharmacists are so good at putting so much unnecessary pressure on ourselves and thinking that we're the worst if we don't hit this goal or, you know, we put these unrealistic expectations and I'm, you know, the pot calling the kettle over here. I mean, I'm living this and coming out of this and it's just so much easier when we can be realistic. And then I do think that that helps alleviate the stress we might be placing on ourselves at work, which will help us physically, mentally, and emotionally be better personally, because then we won't feel, you know, choose instead of choosing to feel guilt when we need to rest, that's not going to be there. We're like, okay, well, I deserve this. Like, this is part of life. Like, there's work and play. And we need to find, like, this, like, you were talking about this harmony, this work-life harmony. That's my favorite. I love work-life fit, work-life harmony. But I will say mentorship is, I feel like it's very underutilized. And people want to help. I will say that. I, I, I think there are a lot of great pharmacists. There's pharmacists that are older than me with whom I speak. There are pharmacists that are kind of, like, in my peer group. And even students and residents. I mean, they you, everybody has so much to offer that I don't think that younger pharmacists necessarily realize that they are reciprocating back to you know their mentors too so you know we all can lean from each other and um, really kind of help to alleviate those random expectations we're placing on on ourselves so I want to go off of that I think a lot of people struggle with mentorship because they don't know how to go about finding a mentor so what are your recommendations or maybe first steps if you want to get a mentor 
and you don't know how to go about it or how to ask? I would say if you're going to kind of look, and it probably depends on your place of practice, but I would say at a certain point, you're going to start to develop relationships, right, with people. Like um, maybe you get to know a few pharmacists better than others. You might shadow them or maybe you work directly with them or you are working on a project or just something, right? So you start to kind of see like who do you vibe with? Like, and why do you vibe with that person? I think that's the first piece. And the second piece is so many of us are so afraid to ask what we want. Like one of my son, my one son today, this is a silly example, but he came in here and kind of passively aggressively said, oh, my friend wanted me to play this video game, but I know you're not going to want me to. And I said, ask for what you want. What do you want? You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm saying that as like a mentor, don't be afraid to ask somebody and just say, hey, I really respect all that you've done i you know appreciate the relationship that we've developed and really admire your work and if you know you're open to it you know would you would you be okay if i you know just stop by to chat every so often or if i really needed some extra support or needed to maybe run an idea by you um would love to get your opinion because i really do value your input and and you're being truthful i mean it's not like we're just padding compliments like i would say pick somebody that you really are you're invested in that relationship, but don't be afraid to ask for what you want. People will actually be very flattered. You'll get the, you'll, you'll feel the vibe. Like when you start vibing with people and, um, even just some people that have come to me, like as moms, they're like, Hey, I'm a new mom. My kid's going to be going to kindergarten at the, your kid's school, you know, pretty soon. Can I, can I chat with you about your experience? Of course you can. And what a, what a lovely thought that somebody even thought of me. So most of the time I would say your experience will be you know, taken or your questions will be taken well, and people do want to help. Like we want, instead of com- promoting like a toxic environment, which I think a lot of people recognize as sort of rampant in medicine in general, like we want to foster more of a collaboration, not competition, right? And support, and we want us all to succeed, and we're coming together to take care of patients, right? That's the end goal. So, don't be afraid. Don't don't be afraid to ask. People want to help. And I think the other thing is not just not being afraid to ask, but if you get a no for whatever reason, don't take mm-hmm. that personally. So sometimes yes. it's just not a right time. Like yes. you had a incredibly busy summer. So if somebody wanted a lot more formal mentorship at that time, it probably wouldn't have been good for you. And you may have said no, or you may have, you know, negotiated some more mm-hmm. limited capacity there. That doesn't right. mean that you didn't want to be their mentor. It just wasn't a good time for you. That doesn't mean it's a no forever. That might be a no for now as yes. well. Yes. And I think we have to just as humans in general, and maybe as newer practitioners, this might be challenging to not take it personally because you're kind of coming out, you're coming out of school and or residency and you still feel like you might need to like tiptoe around things. And, and it's okay. People, you want people to be honest with you too. And I find with myself, I'm not true to my work-life fit. If I used to be the people pleaser who was like, I have to help everyone. I have to do everything. I have to fix everything. And I can't do that. It's not fair to anybody, but most of all, it's not fair to me, right? So we, you know, there are periods of time where I'm like, I have said and have learned how to receive the no, not right now, or maybe down the road. And then you circle back. Or in that other time, you might meet somebody who could be just as good of a fit and is, you know, kind of ready to step into that role. Um, but that doesn't mean you, you know, it's a, a bad relationship or the relationship is soured. It's just sometimes it's it's challenging and people are in very different phases of life. Like I will tell you from the working mom point of view, um, it can get a little tricky. You know, it really can. And I don't expect anybody to understand that because they're not me. But at the same time, I still like in those situations, what I've done is try to say, listen, it can't be like a consistent thing. You have any questions, you reach out to me, I will answer you, you know, like within a 24 hour period, I'll get to you. But um, it's okay to hear the word no. And we have to understand that as, as just, I think, practitioners, like, because we get so nervous, I think, with that. And that doesn't mean, it's not a bad thing, I guess, is what we're trying to say. It's really not. You know, and I think it's a learning opportunity, too. If you hear the word mm-hmm. no from somebody who you're interested in being mentored by, that means they're showing boundaries, probably boundaries mm-hmm. that you want to set for yourself in the future. Mm-hmm. So taking how they say that to you and using that as a learning opportunity, because there are people who can tell somebody no, and it actually feels good. And there mm-hmm. are people who make you feel bad for them saying no when they set their own boundaries. And there's just a art to saying no in a way that makes it the other person feel good. And not everybody is good at that. But if Mm -hmm. you do have somebody who tells you no, and they're able to do it that way, I think that is super valuable to use yourself in the future. I agree. Yeah. That's a really good perspective. And guys take note on that. That's, that is, it's very valuable. So 
I want to go back to the point that you brought up about asking for what you want. And I think this is an area I have seen so many women struggle with, not just in like, what hours do I want? What boundaries do you want to set? What compensation are you asking for? So can you give some advice to maybe women who struggle with those types of ask, asking for what they want within their professional role? I think so many of us are nervous to stand up for ourselves for several reasons. I mean, still there's, you know, just in many professional arenas, there's still kind of like a difference between sometimes how men and women are viewed and maybe just some of the experiences that we have. And especially, you know, from the mom standpoint, um, I mean, I, I personally have experienced some of those challenges. I'm not saying everyone has, but just coming from my, my point of view. But I will say that the older I've gotten, I think it's really um, empowering to know that if you don't ask for something, the answer is always no. But if you do ask for something and the answer is still no, that's not, still not like an absolute. There might be some sort of a compromise. And then in the cases where you do ask for something and, and it's a definite no, then that gives you the the um I want to use the word empowerment again to go back and circle back and say, does this current setup suit my needs still? Like, is this still serving me how it did? And if the answer is yes, great. You know, you might just have to understand that the, you know, you might have to go back to the drawing table again and kind of maybe come back with a different type of proposition. Or if the answer is no, or I really don't think so, that gives you some time to really start thinking about what, you know, what could be next for you. And we kind of talked about like that exit strategy before that maybe it's time to migrate into a different type of role that will give you more of what you want because where you're currently at can't do that for whatever the reason or isn't able to provide that or is making it challenging, I guess, in some cases. So I do think that we have to learn and accept that the only person who's going to to advocate for ourselves really is us. That's another spot too where you could go back to, you know, if you do have a mentor and maybe run some of the dialogue by that mentor or maybe ask for some solicited advice or constructive feedback at that point because they've had, the chances are they've had some more life experience than you do. And I always think it's really neat, like especially when I'm nervous about something, when I see that it's been done whether it's something silly that I've done, like, oh, I have proof, I could do this, I, I'm still here, you know, or you see somebody else before you who is like, well, yeah, you know what, I did negotiate um, my hours and this is how I did it. Then you're like, okay, this is proof that this can be done for me too. It's like super, it kind of empowers you to have that confidence and to believe in yourself because we do get a little, I mean, as, as females, like, we can get a little nervous asking for what we want. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think that's very fair. And I also think it depends on who you're asking that to mm -hmm. um, and your relationship with the people you're asking that for. And I want to talk a little bit about bringing those mentors in with negotiation because, you know, I have a story about this mm -hmm. because whenever I transitioned into my new role, I was not happy with the original offer that I was given. And I had done a lot of research. I knew what was a fair compensation for that role and what I was originally offered. I didn't feel like was a fair compensation. So Carlene was one of the people I reached out to and we had a lot of conversations about what I should do and how I should ask for more. And it wasn't just Carlene. I also had a couple of other people who were my mentors at my current job that was working in that facility that had negotiated their own salaries that gave me some tips as well. And thanks to those mentors and just asking for what I thought I was worth and what I thought I deserved we were able to increase my compensation package by almost $16,000 a year. That mm. is huge. And so if I had chosen not to ask, that would have been a, a big difference in like how we live our life. Like now it's a lot more comfortable to go on vacation. I'm investing more than I was at that time. Those are life changing types of conversations that you can have, whether it's because you're wanting to change a job, which by the way, changing jobs is not a failure at all. I've heard people say that like they feel like they failed if they need to move out of a role that's not serving them, any serving them anymore. I think it's more of a failure if you stay in a role that's not right for you. So I'll step off that don't, soapbox real quick, but <laughs> don't do don't do what I did and stick in a very toxic, toxic environment for nine months because my ego got in the, it, 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 for me, it was ego and I did, it was fail, I, fear, fear of ego, fear of failing. It's not a failure. You, you're, no. you have to, you have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of yourself. 
Yeah, and I think that's kind of been a theme throughout this whole episode is you just have to take care of yourself and also find the support system that can help you take care of yourself because it is hard to know the right things to say when you negotiate, whether that is for hours or pay or just trying to see if this job is going to be a good fit for you in the long Mm -hmm. run. And so having people behind you who have paved the way for you in a sense that have done this already to reach out to, I think is huge. And I know it's made a huge difference for me. I mean, I've been in this role a couple of years now, so that's, that's a lot of extra income that's coming in that I was able to negotiate. Yeah, and I, I think that this, this for the listeners and viewers, uh, just using your story and how you successfully were able to, you know, move into that. Now you, you, you got more of what you were worth. They didn't hesitate with it and you're being fairly compensated and it gives you confidence to show that I, I should be asking more for what I want. It, it gives a confidence. So this is, guys, this, and my, my point is, is this is proof of, you, it's hard to do it at first, but when you actually see a success story and there's a lot of success stories um, that should empower you to know that you are worth it. Absolutely. And that kind of brings me into the next thing for the women in pharmacy, knowing that they're worth it. What do you envision for the future of pharmacy, particularly concerning the role of women and maybe those who are wanting to have a family? So I think it's really fascinating right now, and I think the stat was from July of this year. I think the profession of pharmacy in the United States is like 57% women or close to 57% women. So, and a lot of these women we know have probably had families of some sort or have families of some sort right now or are considering, like you're in a spot where you're considering what that could look like for you down the road. So I think that number one, seeing more women in leadership roles especially women that are serving, um, you know, multifaceted in terms of like maybe having children as well, coming from that, just showing that number one, it's possible. And number two, certain people like that, that's the path they want to take and that's okay. Um, You guys might have pharmacists, there might be women in pharmacy like me who decide, okay, I'm going to probably go kind of go like the part-time thing for a little while and step back. And then all of a sudden, some of these other opportunities that I didn't realize, like the consulting and the writing, I didn't really even think that was a thing, but here I am kind of dipping into that a little bit, right? So I'm serving that way. Um, So just seeing more, I I would like to see more women in leadership roles. I would like to see them actively taking part in pushing our profession. I think we don't hear enough from women and and more from like what we might need. Um, I do love how in the retail, our retail um, friends, how they, really you know spoke up about what they need like especially the moms who were on maternity leave and came back and are breastfeeding and and fought for that and fought for time you know we we need time to do that so i think that the more we humanize you know again the 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 fact that we can have both the better it's going to be for all of us and please know that i do feel there are a lot of companies that are you know, and experiences. I've talked to a lot of pharmacists in different aspects. People are very much supported. It's not like they're not supported, but there are still some, you know, there are people who have had some pretty interesting experiences in corporate America. So I'm pleased to hear that it's moving forward. Um, and, and again, going back to setting those boundaries, we have to set boundaries, press professional and personal, because that helps us prevent burnout. Um, and we don't want to, the more that we can prevent going into burnout, the better I think it, it is versus being in burnout and trying to come out of it. That That's, I mean, we both know we've been there. We both have been in the burnout phase versus like trying to prevent it. And I do think that um, boundaries, asking, we just talked about asking for what you want or maybe saying what no longer works and seeing if, you know, sometimes we're so afraid to have those conversations that if you go in and you speak and explain where you're coming from, companies are willing to work with you. They are. And if they're not, that again, we go back to, that's your time to decide, is this still serving me or is it time for me to start moving on, maybe exploring? And it is not a failure. Please know it is not a failure if it just no longer serves you. That's, it's it's your life, you get to make these decisions and I think that's really empowering. So um, I just you know hope that people understand that, uh, and especially women in pharmacy, that we do have a ways to go, um, but especially because like you were just saying, like the three, you know, the past immediate and current president were all female, and that wasn't very long ago. I mean, that was only a few years ago. So again, that shows us it's possible, but it would be wonderful to continue to watch that piece blossom because I think like, you know, women in those leadership roles have been in our positions and that's who we need speaking for us. 
because they're us. Yeah, I totally right? agree. So it wasn't until the 1970s that we had the first female APHA president. So I think it was like 2017, 2018 when all they were all three uh, women. And so I think that's a really exciting thing to see that we're seeing more women in leadership. But I also want to add not just your formal leadership roles, maybe like your manager, supervisor or in these organizations, but I also am excited to see more women in entrepreneurial roles within pharmacy. You and yes. I are both in those situations where we have some entrepreneurship on the side and we have mm -hmm. several friends uh, that we have both met and we mutual friends for us that are in that same role. So I think it's really exciting to see more women reaching out aside of like the traditional roles within pharmacy. And I think that's an interesting place that we're in right now. I agree. And I think, I think especially because, you know, a lot of people have um, just within our profession, like we don't have like the certified pharmacist practitioner to license, for example, that's not something that's universally available in all 50 states right now. And I think pharmacists are, especially women, we're recognizing there's a lot of different holes we could be filling in patient care and even supporting other people within our profession or broader profession of medicine that I really love to see people, you know, taking on those, you know, those, those, uh, those roles, like you're saying, and just dipping out more into that because there's so much more that we could do and there's so much more that we're going to do. Um, but you have to have the action. There's lots of ideas, but we, we can't make those ideas happen unless there's action. And we're actually, I think you just hit it on the head. We're watching people taking action and we're watching them pivot and you know fill these needs and um, really branch out and i think that's really exciting for for all of us i completely agree so i also wanted to talk about this is kind of on the same line but some emerging trends that you've seen in the profession that make you exciting whether it's like what's coming down the pipeline for medications or just trends you've seen in the job market and as a whole so i think that People in general, pharmacists in general, I think are starting to speak up. Um, we're talking a little bit about, uh, we were, you and I were just speaking a little bit more about what's been going on in the news right now and just about a pharmacist shortage. And I think people are actually speaking up and trying to say like, look, we're in this day to day and operationally, there's some things that we really need to change or you know, maybe we could be bringing in more of X, Y, and Z, which is more important for patient care than the corporate, you know, the corporate delineations of certain metrics, for example. Um, I, I, I just mentioned the certified pharmacist practitioner, just being a clinical pharmacist by training, um, there is so much that we could add and do outside of like consult agreements. Um, if, you know, if this this license becomes available and just we can support more patients and we can, you know, be another, um, just another layer, you know, for the physician and the nurse practitioners and um, physician ass assist associates. And I think it's a really great opportunity for us. And because of our training and our background, I don't see any reason why this shouldn't be, you know, more, more accepted, widely accepted. I, I think, you know, that's going to be something we'll start seeing more of in the future. Um, and I do think that, again, these non-traditional roles that just haven't been widely viewed. And I, and I don't know if you feel this way, Sierra, but I felt like when I came out of school, it was like retail or staff hospital. Like that's yes. all it was. And we have, I mean, home health, there's managed care, there's telehealth. I mean, even like think about some of the pharmacists that are when patients get discharged, now we're doing home health in terms of like calling and following up to make sure, did you get your prescriptions filled? Did you stop taking the script? Um, here are your results from this urine test. Like we just did another one. It came back. Like there's a lot of holes that we could be filling in. And I think the trend is direct patient care. And actually, you know, we're providers, but we need to be providing. So allowing us to maybe have some billing codes and just really filling in these holes that is just not only going to support our other practitioners that we work with directly anyways, but it's going to help to further prevent, you know, more hospitalizations and just all sorts of other things that we do as pharmacists. But we, you know, we have to keep growing in that direction. So we are providers. Let us start providing and let us actually start filling in these gaps a little bit more. And I like it. I'm here to I'm here to see it. I really love it. I, I think it's great. And I love the collab practices, the agreements. I think they're fantastic. But let's take that a step further and offer the certified pharmacist practitioner for people who are ready to sit for that. I mean, there, there could be a lot that we can do. 
Yeah, and I think that it's worked well in several other states. So there is mm-hmm. a precedence that's already been set and data to support moving that forward. And mm-hmm. I think the way that it has been done in the several states that have had it is correct, where you do have to have additional training and show that you are capable of doing those tasks because I do think coming straight out of pharmacy school you probably need a little bit more to go in and do that extra step. I completely understand the need for additional training outside of pharmacy school for that but I think that's in place. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to talk about that you had mentioned is like the decreasing hospitalizations and one term that I have heard brought up a lot at least in our area is hospital at home. And yes. doing more of the home health yes. and yep. having patients at home getting therapies that previously we were only able to do in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And that is a huge emerging platform because the cost of health care is so high in the United States and people being hospitalized, they can't afford to be hospitalized. And sometimes they don't need to be hospitalized to get an infusion. So there's a lot more in terms of outpatient infusion therapies coming mm-hmm. out and opportunities for pharmacists to help patients in more of an outpatient role to get them out of the hospital and maybe more in a comfortable place where they have nurses or pharmacists assisting outside of the home or outside of the hospital at home for more complicated therapies than we've done in the past at a person's home. I agree with you on that. And I do want to also add to like, let's not forget to really recognize and celebrate the contributions that pharmacists and pharmacy technicians made during the, you know, the active phases of the pandemic and were really paramount in vaccinations and even screenings and, and helping to test. And, you know, it was deemed like emergency, you know, it was kind of like an all hands on deck emergency situation, but you, we don't go backwards from that. We showed how valuable and what we really know. And I think, you know, to no fault of the public, it's just been how our profession has been conveyed. They don't realize how specialized our training is and really what our place in medicine is. And I really, really do think that we were able to kind of um, highlight, you know, our profession and abilities and show how we could support that, you know, the United States healthcare system, like during that time. I mean, it was paramount. And, and again, you're in the profession or you work alongside the profession closely. I think a lot of people do value us. I do. But when we actually get to be out there and, and we're visible and people are seeing what we do, then they start understanding more like in that big healthcare pie, what our slice is and what our value is. And I thought that was, I thought that was pretty awesome. You know, I really did. So I think from that, that needs to be looked at as, okay, man, we have all this even more data. Like we need to just keep moving forward. We don't go backwards. Coming from the more research and development side of things, I am seeing more complicated therapies coming down the pipeline where we're going to be doing more infusions instead of like a daily tablet or capsule regimen for these genetic disease states. So we're seeing gene therapies and cell-based therapies that are maybe once a month infusions or maybe one-time infusions for these disease states that right now patients are having to take multiple pills a day, things like cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy and ALS. That is going to change the landscape, but I also can tell you that the prep behind these and who qualifies for these is really complicated. And there's a lot of immunotherapy and uh, other therapies that go along with that that pharmacists are going to be involved in. So as the regimens that we give are more complicated, pharmacists are going to be needed more and more to support that kind of therapy. And we're going to bring that unique set of skills that we have, especially when it comes to drug preparation, to making sure that these therapies go off without a hitch. I agree. That's a really good point. And I I even think the transition to care, we hear that's another buzz phrase. I hate to say buzz phrase, Mm -hmm. but that's another huge buzz phrase that we need to be aware of and a place that we could really aid in, you know, not only preventing like discharge mistakes, like with medication regimens and follow up and infusions and whatnot, but also too, like I kind of touched base before, is actually following up with the patient and and documenting, you know, in a, a, you know, your medical record chart, like some sort of a note about that. And then who's going to, are you transitioning them into like an outpatient clinic where the the next pharmacist is going to kind of like take that over in the health system? Do you know what I'm saying? So there's going to be more, I feel like continuity of care is going to be a little bit more, um, I feel like transparent and more um, systematic. And I think pharmacists have a spot in many different pieces of that that continuity of care. I think we'll be able to ease a lot of that. But they, I think people don't realize just with our unique skill set, the amount of hospital preventions 
you know, not just from medication yes. mistakes, but just the, the side effects, drug interactions, overdoses, um, not taking a medication because a patient is confused. There's so many ways that we can actually sort of smooth that over. So I, I really hope to see us um, shining a little bit more in that area too. Yeah, I completely agree. I think seeing pharmacists in transitions of care, those outpatient settings, and just involved in these more complicated treatment regimens that we're going to see in the future is going to be really exciting for us as a profession. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for the insights on this. And I have a little bit more of a fun question for the last one. So what is your favorite way to relax and enjoy life outside of the pharmacy? Well, Mitz might not be relaxing for many of you, but I am a huge workout dork and I work out a lot. So I'm doing something active almost every single day and I challenge myself to get between 10 and 20,000 steps a day, which is usually pretty successful. Um, but I really do enjoy spending my time active doing that or you can see me outside. I feel kind of like a, a, a you know, just bad these days because I learned how to throw a football. My boys play football, so I learned how to throw a real football this year and I can like spiral it now. So I think I'm super cool. Um, but I also am a, I am a voracious reader. I love to read. And the older I get, I like to read, I don't want to say like romance, like fun books like that, but I dip into a lot of other things. Um, and then another interest area of mine is history. I'm really, really big on just learning about um, American history and just different types of history. But I've uh, spent some time tracing my genealogy on both sides. I was sharing that with you. So um, I'm really interested in uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution. So I'm working on that piece. And then also um, my tracing my lineage, my Italian heritage, which is it's extremely important to, to me. We were raised um, in an Italian household. So it's been really fun. So I, uh, you know, I, I like to notice how all of that and I encourage everybody to have these passions and interests and quirks that are not related to, you know, what you do as a professional. Um, and I think that that kind of helps me kind of chill out. <laughs> That's the best way to say it. So it helps me to chill out. But um, I do make sure that a lot of what I do for myself, and it gets a little bit easier as, as you know, you, you grow into your profession, but make it non-negotiable as often as you can. You deserve that time, however you choose to spend it. Um, That's, you know, it's important for you. It really is. It's non-negotiable. Absolutely. You can't, you can't make it a maybe you have to make it a must in order for yes, it to happen. Agreed. Agreed. So before we end, tell everybody what you have going on right now and how they can connect with you. All right, guys. Well, I am pretty active on Instagram and actually threads. I found threads has been a really fun and therapeutic for me because you guys uh, learned a little bit about how I enjoy writing. So I am at Dr. Carlene Link, all one word. And if you can kind of come down to my channels, you will hear me talk a little bit about, uh, well, not a little bit. I guess I talk mostly about being a working mom in medicine and really supporting other moms and, and just women in general. So if you're into support and encouragement and empowerment, I also have a weekly newsletter that comes out that's full of tips and tricks and support and you know you guys will be um kind of like in the know when all these new things that i'm working on which is a blog and a group for mom and women in medicine um and just you know other women that identify with the type of content i share so would love to have you and have you aboard the connection which is my community and don't be afraid to message me and dm i'm you're gonna see her i'm pretty uh, i respond you know, pretty quickly. So I'm here to support you. And a lot of people are looking for, you know, mentorship or have some questions. And I, I really like that. And I appreciate it. So come say hi. And also, if you guys want to get a little sneak peek in some of Carlene's content and some of the awesome stuff she does as a coach, you can go to happyfarmlife.com forward slash SOS. And she has a free guide waiting for you to help you out. Carlene, can you talk a little bit about what's inside that? Absolutely. So guys, when I became um, an integrative life coach, I did it because of the experience that I had as an overwhelmed mom working full time and really struggled to to just really get it together in my work life fit. And I felt like I always had just pots of life boiling over and, you know, my need would be really heavy on one end. And I've just, I, I had that, that circle of doom. I call it the negative spin cycle where I felt like I was just failing everybody and most of all failing myself. And that's when I decided that, that, that was a way for me to kind of get out there and say, look, I don't see anybody that 
is supporting me and there's not somebody like me out there that I could go and talk to. So I wanted to create this community and this opportunity to help other moms in medicine rediscover their freedoms and satisfaction in their personal and professional life because it is there, but we often just don't know how to get to it. And one of the ways is um, because we feel so overwhelmed, we all know that feeling, right? Maybe your chest tightens, your stomach might tighten, your, your heart might be racing, you know, your, your brain might be spinning. And there's a guide that I created, it's called the Stop, Open and Stay or the SOS method. And it helps to really get you kind of out of that state of overwhelm and more into like a relaxation, like feeling of presence so you can breathe and actually figure out, okay, here I am now. I'm here. I can feel it. What do I do next? And that's what this guide is. And the best part about this guide is it's a very modified form of a tapping and it really helps to reduce that feeling of overwhelm within 90 seconds. You could do it anywhere. You could do it in your office. You could, if you're in the car and you're driving, you can just, you know, tap and you're talking out loud to yourself. You could do it on the phone with somebody. If you need to talk to someone, you could write it in a journal. Like you really could do it anywhere and you literally need, you know, just about 90 seconds. That's it to help calm you down. So she shared it with me. I found it very helpful, which is why I wanted to make sure that she shared it with you guys. So make sure you check that out. Happyfarmlife.com forward slash SOS. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching. And Carlene, thank you for being here. And until next time, keep on living your happy farm life. Bye. Thank you. Happy Women in Pharmacist Day.